Mr. Kroc, welcome to Voice of America. Oh, thanks so much for having me, Daphne. I really appreciate it. Okay, Mr. Kroc, you are a uh, Silicon Valley veteran and now a former State Department official. Um, what was your private sector experience like, especially with China, and why did you decide to serve in government? Well, my first experience in China was back in 1981 when I first went over there, right when I joined uh, General Motors. And, uh, you know, I'm a lover of Chinese history uh, and, the China, and the Chinese culture. I've been going there for many, uh, many years, obviously, on, on business. But the last trip I t took before I went into government, when I was running DocuSign, mm -hmm. it was a listening uh, trip because we were deciding whether we want to enter the country of China. But at that particular time, I could see things had changed and I could see how aggressive uh, General Secretary she was. And, um, and that's what really gave me some concern. Uh, and I really didn't know anybody in Washington except uh, one high level official who I had worked with before. And, and I wanted to see if they really understood what was mm -hmm. uh, going on. And, and, and uh, they obviously did. And then they asked me, they said, have you ever thought about serving your country? Mm -hmm. And I said, that would be, that's a dream I never knew I had. I'd be honored. They said, can you move? I, can, I go, I can move anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's been a great privilege. And my mission was to develop and operationalize a global economic security strategy that would maximize global economic security and national security for uh, countries everywhere and to drive economic growth as well as to combat China's economic aggression. And also when you traveled to Germany last year, you went viral on social media when you said, I quote here, Mr. Xi, tear down China's great firewall. Why did you say that in Berlin? And what was your overall China strategy when you were undersecretary at State Department? Right. Well, uh, I was right at the Berlin Wall. And uh, it really reminded me, and I drew the analogy between how the Berlin Wall separated the German people just as China's great one-way firewall separates the Chinese people mm -hmm. uh, from the truth. And that's when I asked uh, uh, General Secretary Xi to, to tear down that firewall um, because all the data comes in, but uh, none goes out, and all the propaga propaganda goes out, but the truth does not come in. Mm -hmm. um, and so... If you look at uh, my strategy uh, at the State Department, and I said this in my Senate confirmation meeting, it's really uh, to harness three of the United States' biggest competitive advantages. That is, strengthen our relationship with our allies and our friends, mm -hmm. leverage the innovation and resources of the private sector, and amplify the moral high ground of democratic values. Okay, and you are also the highest ranking State Department official who visits Taiwan since 1979. Could you please share with us more detail of that important trip from your perspective? Yeah, it, it obviously was a great honor and it really fit in uh, with our overall uh, strategy. The purpose of my trip was to go to President Lee's memorial service, right? We would call him the George Washington uh, of Taiwan. I was greeted with uh, 40 fighters and, and bombers um, but it really gave me a chance mm -hmm. uh, to interact with a lot of the business people that I've interacted with uh, before over the years from the private sector, yeah. but also spent a lot of time with the government. And, and I had a great uh, dinner with uh, President Tsai, and it was really there that we uh, came up with the, uh, uh, it was a catalyst for our economic prosperity partnership between Taiwan and the United States. You said that you interacted with the businessmen there in Taiwan. Now we know that you also helped foster strong economic ties between U.S. and Taiwan, especially uh, including a $12 billion deal with Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, TSMC. That's a big deal. It was the biggest onshore in U.S. history. And TSMC is perhaps uh, the most important global company to uh, the United States national security. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was a great experience. We actually accomplished that uh, in two weeks. And they also brought their ecosystem. And I really think this really helped strengthen the ties between the United States and Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And it's so important because uh, Taiwan uh, in the region is a role model 
for democracy and capitalism. Actually, they are for, for the entire world. You also mentioned that the PLA sent nearly 20 fighter jets and bomber when you were there. What was your reaction to that? It, you know, my reaction was, uh, uh, why are you doing that? I mean, it, it, I think that, uh, you know, they wanted to show some force. I was going over there uh, to honor uh, a, a great person. I think it's, it's classic it's for, of the Chinese Communist Party. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then we know that the tensions across the Taiwan Strait actually have risen considerably over recent months. You know, we hear a lot of people in Washington DC talking about like, what could happen if China tried to invade Taiwan? How worried are you that China will have a war with US well, over I, Taiwan? Yeah, well, I think that's a possibility. And, uh, you know, that was a big purpose of forming that uh, economic prosperity partnership. And then a month later, we signed a science and technology uh, agreement, which usually takes a year to get done in the United States government, and really laid the groundwork in terms of more trade and investment I th from the United States. And that also draws uh, uh, investment into Taiwan mm -hmm. from other nations, from our allies. And I think that's really important when it comes to defending Taiwan. Okay, and you also recently co-wrote an op-ed in Newsweek in which you said, the moral imperative to end the Xinjiang genocide is one of the most unifying and bipartisan issue of our time. You're also calling for American business to help stop the genocide in Xinjiang. So could you please share with you your thoughts on what, how they can help and why taking actions on this issue is so important to you? Well, if, first of all, it's, it's punishable genocide. These are some of the worst crimes to humanity that are going on in, in the world. So to call that out, I think is very important. Mm -hmm. And I think it exemplifies uh, uh, General Secretary Xi's uh, three C's doctrine of concealment, co-option, and coercion. Now it's grown uh, into genocide. And, and what I called on uh, for people around the world is to join together mm -hmm. and to do something about that. Uh, I wrote uh, a letter to all United States CEOs uh, about this, about um, uh, in terms of making sure their supply chains are clean without the slave labor uh, from Xinjiang. I also wrote one to all the university governing boards. I wrote to all the civil societies. But I think at the end of the day, for the American citizen, the way to really speak uh, the loudest is to ring the cash register mm -hmm. over there uh, in China because there are so many companies that enable, Chinese companies that enable uh, the, uh, the surveillance state and the atrocities in Xinjiang. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the whole point is to divest of these companies, don't invest in these companies. You're a successful businessman before um the businesses around the world, sometimes, you know, standing up to China's human rights abuses is easier said than done. Like um, the Xinjiang cotton is one example. So you were chairman and CEO of tech companies, including Ariba and DocuSign. I believe that you are very well aware of those difficult decisions companies have to make between profits and ethics when doing business with China. What would you say to those leaders of multinational companies that who constantly have to make those difficult decisions? Yeah, well, I think it's a question of your principles or profit. And uh, the way I was raised and where I come from, your integrity is everything at the end of the day. And if you don't have that, you have absolutely nothing. And so, yes, you do have to make those decisions. And as a CEO or a chairman of the board, you get paid uh, to make those uh, tough decisions. And they also uh, have a moral responsibility and a fiduciary duty uh, to make sure that whoever they do business with mm -hmm. uh, is upstanding, and, and particularly when you're talking about an issue as big as genocide. Right. Um, one, most, one of the most common metaphor of U.S. and China relations is that we're running a marathon, but who is the winner at the last? So let's talk about uh, U.S. and China are engaging in a very fierce competition 
over the technological supremacy. As a prominent leader in the tech industry, how do you view this competition? And what kind of actions should U.S. take right now to ensure it's not on the losing side of this U.S.-China tech war? Yeah, well, I think really three fundamental aspects to it. The first one is to turbocharge uh, our own economic competitiveness. The second is to safeguard our assets, our strategic assets, our technology, which has been so much intellectual property theft through the years. The third one is to form an alliance of democracies, companies, civil society that operate by a set of trust principles for all areas of economic collaboration. Because if you think of what the CCP has done, They've used those trust principles like integrity, transparency, reciprocity, respect for rule of law, respect for the planet, respect for uh, property of all kinds uh, to their economic advantage. So what we did with the Clean Network Alliance of Democracies is we actually used it against them. And we said, if you don't abide by those trust principles, mm -hmm. we're not going to do business with you. And Mr. Kroc, your team at the State Department also developed a 5G clean network that turned the tide against Huawei. How important is that 5G clean network? Can you explain? Well, well I think that's really important because it, def it defeated China Inc.'s master plan to own 5G communications. And 5G communications is just not your fault. This is about utility grids. This is about Internet of Things, manufacturing processes, uh, all kinds of sanitation systems. So this is a really important thing. But what it, what it really was is it also uh, showed that China Inc. was beatable mm -hmm. and it exposed their biggest weakness, which was lack of trust. But the other two objectives was to create a model for competing with China Inc. as well as to provide a beachhead for many other uh, areas of economic collaboration, mm -hmm. whether it's clean infrastructure with clean financing, clean energy, uh, other areas of technology. Mm -hmm. And also earlier this year, you and the former Secretary of State, Mr. Pompeo, and also uh, 26 others were labeled as anti-China politician. And you were on number three on the list, you know, to be sanctioned by China, which means that you and your immediate family member are prohibited from entering China. And companies and the institutions associated with you are also restricted from doing business with China. What is your response to China's sanction on you, your business, and your family? Well, um, I got sanctioned because I did my job and I got uh, results. It's inconsequential uh, to me uh, and my family. Uh, you know, it, it really doesn't. Yeah, it really doesn't matter. Maybe you know. Maybe it's a uh, a medal of honor. Uh, but why should I uh, react when I can act? And I am not going to bend a knee to uh, General Secretary Xi. And I don't think anybody else should as well. U.S.-China relationship is complicated. It's like love, hate, and also cooperation at the same time with competition. Um, what should U.S. do about it right now? Because it, now it is at the lowest point in decades. And um, what's your hope for the future of this relationship? Yeah, well, I always remain hopeful, uh, for sure. But I, but I also think that, uh, that General Secretary Xi has really amped up uh, the aggression. And even though they say, hey, a win-win relationship, it's not. It's a zero-sum game. And I think the world has woken up to the truth about uh, uh, his three C's doctrine of concealment, co-option, and coercion. And the world now understands that the pandemic is a result of the concealment of the virus. Mm -hmm. I mean, they shut everything down. People lost their lives, all kinds of things like that. And I think people can see the co-option in Hong Kong has resulted in evisceration of its citizens' freedoms. Mm -hmm. And now the coercion in Xinjiang has grown to genocide, and the world doesn't like it. It's the most unifying bipartisan issue uh, of our time. And I think, uh, you know, if you, if you look at that, you know, the 800-pound elephant in the room is uh, the CCP's retaliation and intimidation. And this is why the Clean Network was so successful, because it represents a security blanket 
there's strength in numbers and there's power in unity and solidarity. And I think the world's woken up now. Mr. Kroc, if you could send a message to Xi Jinping, what would it be? Uh, I guess I would say um, the world does not trust you. And uh, you sanctioned me, it has, it has no effect on me. And, but it sends a message to the Biden administration, sends a message to business leaders all over the world that you're not to be trusted. And there's consequences for that. Ms. Krog, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you, Daphne.